good morning in India. So today uh, we'll have a lecture from Professor Tarun Soradip. Uh, Professor Tarun Soradip is the uh, chairman of the Department of Physics in ISER, uh, Pune, in India. So Professor Tarun Suradip uh, finished uh, his PhD education uh, from Ayuka, uh, Pune, India, uh, 1995. Uh, Professor Tarun Suradip uh, has a research interest in cosmology, especially in cosmic microwave background, large scale structure in the universe, primordial cosmological perturbation from inflation, early universe and application of QFT uh, in uh, curved search space time. And he also interested in gravitational wave. And uh, once he led the Indian observational program in gravitational wave uh, observation, uh, uh, LIGO India. So uh, we have a very excellent expert today to explain you uh, with the CMB and large scale structure. So uh, the time is yours, Professor oh, Tarun Suradi. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please. It's disabled for me. So can you uh, enable? Uh, whoever is the host of the meeting can. Yeah. Uh, please. Sharing the enable. Enable. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, you okay. can share now. Okay. Great. Okay, can you all see my screen? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes sir. Yes, good. Okay, excellent. Okay, so thank. let me begin by thanking Anton and um, for inviting me to this, uh, uh, give this lectures uh, to you all in the school. Uh, this is uh, great to be able to talk to students in Indonesia, uh, very, uh, close neighbors culturally as well as uh, you know geographically and it's a pleasure to be able to connect to you i also thank professor kunje for his very uh, nice uh, introduction and so let me outline what i'm going to do so i wanted to give you a, a feel for how cosmic micro background has been refining our understanding of the universe at this point and also in the next lecture i will expose you to the new directions of course in two lectures uh, you can't give details but i hope you will get uh, to know what questions to ask okay and what to look forward to and uh, so let me get started so first let me tell you that uh, most of our progress has happened because of the title of my talk so because we started understanding the perturbed universe and I'll explain to you how, uh, you know, this is placed in context. So if you look at our uh, universe in a big region of the universe, you will see galaxies spread around in very intricate structures. So if this is a nice video, uh, the link is given here and you see that uh, as you zoom in, they are layers and layers of scales on which they are structures. They are big superclusters of galaxies. And these are all individual galaxies which are arranged in some kind of a foam like network. And as I zoom into it, I see smaller and smaller structures. So for example, you can see a cluster emerging somewhere, three galaxies very close by. And uh, you know, this is our picture of the universe. So if I were to look at one uh, representative volume of the universe. And that is how we started thinking about cosmology now with all the data we have. Uh, you will see a picture something like this. And this is from a real survey called the two degree field survey. And this is how the galaxies are distributed in a typical region of the universe. So you can see the galaxies are made, images are put, even the color of the galaxies represented there. The gray milky thing that you see is just to 
point out the kind of network of galaxies that we have. So it's called the cosmic web, right? And we even anywhere you look, you know, this volume here is 100 megaparsecs on the side. Okay, 100 million parsecs on each side. So typically on these scales, any region of the universe would look something like this statistically. Okay. Now, of course, if someone were to ask you to explain the universe and tell you, you know, to start with all this complexity, you would wonder how can we even hope to comprehend such an immensely large and complex universe. And that is where I think our training as physicists and cosmology is just a branch of physics. And so that comes handy because we know how to take a problem and simplify and look for what is the simplification that captures the main aspects of the uh, system that we're looking at, in this case, the universe. So if I were not to worry about the position of the galaxies relative to us, but project all the galaxies we see back onto the sky, even way back in 1970s, this is a very old picture from the Lick Observatory Survey, you would see that all the regions of the universe, the distribution of galaxy looks more or less the same. Okay, this is the left side is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. Of course, in those days, you couldn't peer through the own galactic disk. So there is a region of the sky which was not visible in optical. Nowadays, of course, uh, in infrared, you are able to peer through a lot of that. Okay, and in other, at other wavelengths. But this already told you that you could assume that the distribution of matter in the universe was statistically the same in any direction. So there was no direction in the universe that was saying that I am special. Everywhere it looked like more or less the same situation. So it's a mathematical theorem that if the universe distribution of matter is isotropic around us, and we assume that we are not special and uh, the distribution must be isotropic around any observer in the universe, then it immediately mathematically tells you that the distribution of galaxies is statistically homogeneous. Yes, there are features, there are networks, but on big enough scale like the 100 megaparsec box, the universe looks the same everywhere, is, is the same everywhere. And that is how cosmological models were built. So the first models of cosmology started with this very simplifying principle called the cosmological principle, which said the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. The distribution of matter is homogeneous, isotropic at any given time in the universe. If I look at the entire universe, the distribution is the same. And that led to the models of cosmology that we currently work with. Those are the Friedman, Lebatre, Robertson, Walker models. Okay, and I'm sure uh, many of you would be familiar with it. Okay, so I tried, I kind of um, told you a reason why you should think the universe is homogeneous, uh, matter distribution is homogeneous. The strongest evidence for that comes actually not from the matter in the universe, but from the radiation backdrop. So in 1965, uh, serendipitously, a dish that was set up in Bell Labs discovered the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background, and you should pay attention to all the words that I say, is the dominant radiation content of the universe. And this radiation is extremely isotropic. In fact, so isotropic that for 25 years, no one could find uh, any variations. Okay, and also the spectrum of the black body uh, of the photons in this background followed a black body curve. Okay, and the black body is at a temperature of uh, this 2.725. And these were things we learned at the beginning of 1990, where I thought uh, I would think that there was a revolution in cosmology. Okay, with the COBE satellite. Okay, now let me tell you, although it's a three Kelvin bath, so it doesn't look like it's very energetic. If I were to count up the total amount of energy in the cosmic micro background, it is far greater than any other background that we see in the universe. The gamma ray background is right here. Can you see my cursor? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, then there's the X-ray background and the closest cousin to CMB is the far infrared background, which was created by star formation, during star formation. But this is at least almost two orders of magnitude larger than that. And the, uh, you know, nine, fair to say 99% of the radiation content of the universe is uh, contained in the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so there are about 400 photons of the cosmic microwave background per cubic centimeter. And what was amazing is in 1991, this is one of the most beautiful measurements done in astronomy. Um, uh, satellite called Cosmic Background Explorer had an instrument called the Far Infrared Absolute Spectrometer, and that measured the spectrum of this black body in energy, of, of this radiation in energy, and found that it was very well fit by a black body curve. The level of uh, you know, accuracy here is reflected by the fact that you see it says it's 400 sigmas. So the error bars have been increased by a factor of 400 to make them visible on this plot. It is so, you know, so, so very accurate a measurement. Okay, and over a range of frequencies from 60 gigahertz to 600 gigahertz, we know that there are no deviations from the black body, uh, detectable de deviations that we can measure. Okay, for cosmology, this is a big, for understanding the universe, there's a big simplification. The matter may have a very complex network, but the dominant radiation content of the universe is characterized by one single number. If I know the temperature of a black body, I know its energy density, I know everything, okay? And hence the CMB temperature marks for you the universe at a particular time, okay? And if I go for a universe, uh, I forgot to mention the Friedman Robertson Walker universe models told you that the universe is either expanding or contracting. And we know that it's expanding from observations of Hubble. And so it's a expanding universe. So of course the CMB bath is getting diluted, okay? But at any epoch, the temperature of the cosmic background is a measure of how much dilution or how much expansion has happened in the universe, okay? So the universe, when the universe was thousand times smaller in size, everything was thousand times uh, closer to each other. At that time, the temperature of the microwave background was 3000 Kelvin. I'll get back. Uh, so this is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with space-time diagrams, but this is a space-time diagram where time for people who can discern the difference is conformal time. And these are spatial hypersets of the universe at a particular time drawn in this nice uh, rectangle, okay, shaded thing. So these are stacks of the universe at different time. And we are here and now, and you should realize that I in cosmology or even in astrophysics, our only way to look at the universe is through the radiation or other messengers that come to us from distance. Okay, largely most of astronomy is based on electromagnetic radiation coming from them. Uh, in the past few decades, there've been neutrino studies and now of course gravitational waves is another new messenger. But nevertheless, the gravitational waves as well as light all travel at the speed of light and hence they come to us from this backward light cone. So if I go along this light cone, I see a universe which is far away. If I want to see a galaxy far away, it is somewhere on this light cone. So I'm actually seeing it as it was in the past. In fact, it may not have occurred to you that when I, we see the sun, we are seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Okay, if there was something happening in the sun, we will get to know of it only eight minutes later because light travel time is eight minutes. But from a galaxy, distant galaxy, it could be billions of years. Okay. And then as you go further and further, you know, you go back to an epoch when the universe was about thousand times smaller. So this cosmic micro background, instead of being at three Kelvin, was at 3,300 Kelvin. And at that time, then the universe, the cosmic background was hot enough 
to keep all the hydrogen. Our universe is largely made of hydrogen and helium, you know, 75, 25 kind of hydrogen is 75%, helium is 24%, and rest of the stuff is within a percent. Okay. And then this thing is the surface where hydrogen and helium are totally ionized. So you are as if as I go back in time, I hit something like a fog. A plasma is something which is, you know, it, it is in plasma state. So electrons are free from their atoms and they scatter light. And so hence any signal that you can want it to send from the universe earlier than that would scatter around so much that you will have no coherent information. This is what happens when you are in a fog. When you look through, you can see things up to a distance, but further there are things and they are emitting light, but the light, you know, is gets so diffused and mixed up that it doesn't really come to you as a coherent signal. Okay. So that means that around every observer in the universe, there is a distance, maximum distance up to which you can probe with electromagnetic waves and then you hit a wall. So a nice picture of this is here. So imagine that you're at the center here and now, as I look out, I'm uh, looking out, I go 43 billion light years away. So I'm looking at a galaxy, uh, you know, where from where light has traveled for 10 billion years here, something, something. And then I hit this plasma screen all around me. So to me, a nice way to think about it is like a super IMAX theater. IMAX theater only gives you a part of the dome, but nature has given us an entire, you know, full sphere around us, which is a plasma screen placed 43 billion light years away. And if you think of it, because the universe is homogeneous, every observer anywhere in the universe will see this screen, which is placed 43 billion light years away. And why is the screen so important for cosmology? That's because, as I told you, when I look out, <coughs> if I look at a distance, I'm seeing the universe in the past. So when we are looking at this plasma screen, whatever see, I see on the plasma screen happened in the universe when the universe was only half a million years old. And at this point, you should realize that our universe is 14 billion years old, almost 14 billion years old. But the universe is transparent only up to that. So all the galaxies we see are all in this volume, which is around us. And then there's this opaque shell, which is preventing us from making any electromagnetic observations beyond this. And this radiation that comes from that there is the cosmic micro background. So it's as if I'm looking at a furnace, which is at 3,300 Kelvin. And it's so much that there's a basically a plasma there. And all I can do is try to see what physics is happening on this plasma surface. And that will tell us what was happening in the universe long back when the universe was only half a million years old. Okay. So one th uh, 28th of its, uh, you know, age now. And as I told you, the COVID satellite discovered that the distribution of this radiation is completely consistent with a black body. And as you know, a black body means that radiation has thermalized with matter. And, you know, also there have to be photon number violating processes. So this is, this thermalization is happening in this orange band here. And it tells you that the universe must have been at least 10 million uh, uh, hot, uh, Kelvin hot and, you know, also about then, you know, 10 to 28 times denser in its past. So we do have a clear indication that we probably are in a hot Big Bang model where the universe started from a hot early phase. Okay, that is uh, absolutely set now. The question is, now the universe is expanding in time. So this is time and this is the relative size. The question is, what crack is it taking? Okay, is it expanding? and then contract, we'll contract later. At this point, of course, we see it expanding. So this point is where our current observation is. The question is, it is going to uh, you know, expand at a constant rate, you know, a slightly uh, larger rate, or is it going to actually expand at a faster and faster rate? 
and that is determined in the simple model of cosmology by the amount of matter that clusters. This is the clustering matter omega m, and non-clustering matter, which we are forced to accept exists. We don't know what it is, but this is given the name of dark energy, and we are very smart in cosmology. Anything we don't understand, we call it dark. So we call it dark matter, dark energy. So you have heard talks about dark matter, but this is uh, evidence in the universe that there is dark energy. And the radiation actually at this point plays no role in the evolution. So at this point, the universe, there are three things playing a role, the matter density, the you know, vacuum density. So one model of the non-clustering matter is vacuum energy density and the curvature of the universe. And this is how uh, the, these are the three numbers we need to determine to understand which track we are on. Okay. So how much do we know about the universe now? So it's a simple model of the universe, a homogeneous isotropic model, but how much do we know? In fact, what is amazing and it's amazing may not be amazing for students here because they almost started with all this information now. Uh, for me, when I started, we didn't know few of the numbers by factors of two, right? But now we know lots about the model. So our current understanding of how much ordinary matter is there, the measurement is at 1% accuracy. How much dark matter is there is at about 2% accuracy. And the expansion rate is at about one5 percent accuracy. So we know the universe extremely well. Okay. And we know that a very simple model of the universe where the spatial uh, hypersurfaces, which are evolving in time, I showed you a picture of these spatial hypersurfaces one after the other. Those are geometrically flat. And the universe, as I told you, is dominated uh, by something mysterious called dark energy, but I, I will stick to vacuum energy or the cosmological constant. So it's a cosmological constant, which is denoted by lambda, cold dark matter model, that with just six numbers, you can explain everything you see in a, uh, the universe. Okay, and this is amazing. So the question is, how do we know so much about it now? What changed in this last 30 years? Because you know, I told you in 1990, when I just started my research, when Kobe had just got its results, uh, <clears throat> we hardly knew things uh, within a factor of two. That is because Kobe gave us a glance also into the perturbed universe. So remember the plasma screen, which was totally blank. We knew that it cannot be totally a uniform bath of photons because matter and radiation were tightly coupled at the plasma surface. And if the matter has grown to give you this large scale structure, perturbation the matter, there must be some remnants of that left when it started evolving separately from the radiation. And this remnant fluctuation in the microwave background temperature has to be there. And it took from 1965 to 1992 to detect them. And we finally, when we looked at the, you know, uh, the plasma screen, where we could discern temperature fluctuations at the level of 10 parts per million. We COVID saw first time that there were fluctuations in the temperature in the, so there were patterns in the, on the sky in the microwave temperature. I already told you that we had already established the year before that from Kobe other instrument on this was, uh, this fluctuation was seen by something called a differential microwave radiometer, DMR instrument. The other instrument gave you the spectrum. And this is the first picture of uh, fluctuations that were measured in the distribution of the cosmic micro background in different directions. And this was heralded as a big step in cosmology because now you saw the signature of um, this um, micro background, um, you know, uh, actually having interactive matter and have the seed perturbations from which large scale structure grew. So the picture we have is that there is something that created these primordial fluctuations. And this is something that I won't talk much about, 
because there you have an entire uh, invited talk uh, by uh, Professor Ichiro Komatsu, uh, and I okay. think he will cover this very well. Okay, but this fluctuations actually led to the large scale structure that we see in the universe. Okay, so given the immense uh, importance of the results from Kobe, George Smoot and John Mather got the Nobel Prize in nine, uh, 2006. And then things became fairly well-defined uh, problem in cosmology. So I have a picture of the universe, distribution of matter in the universe now. Okay, and I showed you the video uh, and the representative uh, picture of distribution of galaxies, which is shown again here in this red distribution of galaxies. The yellow thing are galaxies and the red part is the cold dark matter distribution. But we know that these fluctuations are related to the tiny fluctuations at 10 part per million, which we measure in the microwave background sky. Okay. So this is a very interesting situation to be in physics. You know, a physics problem is very easy to solve. If I know the initial condition and the final condition, and I know the equations governing the evolution in between, and we believe the equations governing the evolution is gravitational instability. This was earlier a belief, but I will tell you in the next lecture that we have actually confirmed that it is gravitational instability in two different ways. We know that there is gravitational instability happening. And gravitational instability is something that was worked out by Jim Peebles and many other scientists at that time, but I'm talking about James Peebles because he's the one who got the Nobel Prize uh, when Planck actually established the model of cosmology. And essentially, he worked out how these small fluctuations in the microwave background would evolve to this. And then, of course, people refined it but we knew that it depend on the total density of the universe, the amount of ordinary matter, the dark matter, amount of vacuum energy or the cosmological constant and expansion rate. And that's about it. So then my thing is I know the mechanism, I know the initial state, I know the final state. I have a bunch of dials for each of these. So I look at what combinations of values of these parameters will give you a consistent picture starting from the CMB observations to these last scale structure observations. And that is where we made the progress. Because when we tried to match these two pictures, the values of the cosmological parameters, the ones listed here, had to take very constrained values. And so that's why we have values measured at a percent level. Okay, this is exactly, precisely what is happening. Now let me spend a little time about the progress of measurements in the micro background uh, field. So as I told you, Kobe opened the field with its first detection of fluctuations in 1992. And Kobe made measurements between 1991 to 1994. I mean, papers came out of Kobe during that period. And then the next decade was uh, dominated by another uh, satellite mission, which was very successful, called the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotopy Probe. Uh, more commonly known as WMAP. Okay, and WMAP mapped the same fluctuations but at a better angular resolution. So you can now see much more refined features in this. Okay, and then the next decade belonged to Planck where these things were measured to exquisite accuracy. In fact, so much so that we believe that we have exhausted all the information that is available in the temperature fluctuations which have a bearing on the cosmological model. Okay, I should also point out these are milestone missions, uh, which actually caught all the limelight for the public. But all through there have been many, many ground based observations of micro background and many, many experiments done from various places, good uh, sites in the world. And these experiments are still going on and it may be that the next decade is dominated by ground experiments. Um, before another satellite comes up, which we'll hear about uh, from Ichiro uh, in a couple of days. Okay, now what do we see on the microwave background sky? So we see temperature fluctuations, which I showed in color. 
So these temperature fluctuations, as I told you, are essentially you take out the mean temperature of the micro background, which is written there, uh, you know, about three Kelvin. And then the fluctuations there are random and they have a RMS, root mean square value of about 70 micro Kelvin. Okay, this is a low resolution map of the temperature fluctuations. And that is low because I've wanted to focus on these sticks. Uh, though I won't talk too much about it, in addition to the temperature fluctuation, the microwave background has a linear polarization at about 10% in any direction that you look. Okay, and so if any direction where you're measuring the microwave background, you can associate a stick in the sky, which tells you the plane of the polarization. Okay, and this stick varies all over the sky, and this is typically a pattern of sticks which you can represent by two scalar fields. One is E and one is B. The E scalar field, uh, its gradient gives you these sticks and the B pseudo scalar field, something like a curl of that, gives you another contribution to this. And we know that the contribution, we have measured the contribution from the E mode quite well, uh, not so much the B modes, right? Actually, that is the whole quest now. Okay, now you have a random map on the sky of fluctuations, just like I, you know, if I have a table given to me and I wanted to map uh, what is the fluctuations of the surface, how, how smooth is the surface, and I can measure it and I will find some RMS value of say 100 microns. Okay, and then I can also ask not only the question, a table has the same value of uh, RMS on any scale. But suppose I leave the table in the rain and both Indonesia and India are places where there's quite a bit of rain. You leave a wooden table in the rain, it will warp, it will have other features. Now if I ask what is the deviation at different scale, of course at small scales, the fluctuations in the table would be the roughness of the uh, layer that you have put at the top of the table. But on larger scales, you will see much, much bigger fluctuations. So the way we quantify such things is something called a power spectrum. In the same way, I have fluctuations in the microwave background temperature. I can ask how much is the power, how much is the RMS fluctuation at different angular scales. And that is captured in a quantity called CL which is the angular power spectrum. So usually whenever you see these curves, they are L into L plus one CL, which tells you how much is the power in the fluctuations at a scale uh, given by about pi over L. So if I'm looking at L equal to 100, I'm looking at you know uh, fluctuations at 1.8 degrees, okay? And if I'm looking at L equal to 1000, I'm looking at 0.18 degrees. So this is something that you can compute. And again, referring to Jim Peebles, he was among the first people to make these predictions. Of course, they were the first papers and then there were a lot of refinement by people like Dick Bond and Ipstashu and many, many others. Okay. And finally, we have now codes, which any of you can run on your laptop, uh, where you input the parameters of cosmology and it will predict for you what the angular power spectrum will look like. And on this plot, you see, a uh, set of power spectra where I have varied one of the cosmological parameters at a time. Here the expansion rate is varied, here the total energy density is varied, here the ordinary matter density is varied. And you can see every curve, the curves are very sensitive to changes in the parameter. So it was always clear that if measurements told you which curve was the, actually the angular power spectrum of the CMB sky given to us that we measure, that would constrain cosmology very well. So it will constrain all the parameters. And that is what happened. Okay, that is exactly what happened. And the biggest advantage of using this was that all these features that you see, see you can see that there are a lot of features in the microwave background. And this bumps and wiggles are based on very simple physics of resonant phenomena on the plasma surface. So plasma surface is an elastic medium. And if you perturb it, 
a, there are basically acoustic waves which move around. So this acoustic physics was pointed out by Sakharov. These are called Sakharov oscillations and also, uh, you know, so this temperature fluctuation that I, angular power spectrum CL that I measure, consists of the temperature uh, density perturbations in the photons in this green. And also the photons are moving relativistically in the sound waves. The sound wave is actually relativistic. So wherever the plasma surface th is moving towards you, it gets blue shifted and wherever it's moving away from it gets red shifted. So there's additional com contribution shown in this dashed red line, which is due to the Doppler shift. So we measure both the combination of the density fluctuations on the plasma surface and the velocity field on the plasma surface. I should mention here that the polarization actually only measures the velocity field. And hence we have also a way to uh, find out what is the relative uh, you know, strength of these two uh, phenomena. And we know what it should be if fluctuations are adiabatic, uh, you know, entropy preserving or not entropy preserving. Okay. And so the whole curve can be dissected very, very finely. And all the physics that we think is relevant has been worked out to death. So when more moment we measure the angular power spectrum here, we can derive a huge amount of information about the physics that's happening. All this physics is governed by the cosmological parameters, the amount of matter, ordinary matter, and things like that. The physics is well understood is something I wanted to uh, emphasize. And that is why we have so much confidence in the inferences we can draw from the microwave background. Okay. So let me tell you what kind of physics. The physics is very beautiful and it's very simple. So I wanted to explain to you. So this is like a resonant phenomena. So it's like a cosmic drum. Uh, if you take a drum, okay, and if I just show it to you, you may not be able to tell me whether it is stretched right. How do you know that it has been stretched to the right tune? It is by hitting it with a, a hammer or hitting it with a you know drum stick. And then you know that the note it has played is the right one. So it's the same question. I have this plasma screen and I have perturbations. Now question is, what are those perturbations like? So if you want to understand that, let's try to look at a piece of the plasma surface and create a fluctuation in it. So I create a spike in the thing. What will happen there is the universe is full of ordinary matter, radiation, cold dark matter and everything. The ordinary matter, the baryonic matter, couples to the electromagnetic uh, waves. And when I make this peak, the baryons would want to get gravitated into this. However, the photons are relativistic and very energetic at that time. They can manage to keep the baryons from falling. So what happens is there's a ripple created very much like when a raindrop falls on the surface of a lake, there's a ripple created. Okay. Now when what we see is the CMB fluctuation map is a superposition of many such ripples. So I could give you an analogy, which I enjoy telling students. So you imagine you are standing by the side of a placid lake. The lake has no disturbances at all. And certainly there's a burst of shower. Okay, raindrops fall everywhere. Now then, if I wait, say 15 seconds after that, I will see completely choppy waters, right? The question is, is there any information there? And as physicists, we know that there is information you can get by using uh, the Fourier domain. If you take the Fourier transform, you can discern that around every ripple in that 15 seconds, under, uh, around every raindrop, which fell, a ripple was created and the ripple traveled for 15 seconds before I took the picture. And the choppy waters is just a superposition of all these ripples, okay? And this distance that the wave can travel is given by the speed of the sound wave there on the surface of the lake here in the universe. And here we know that the speed of a wave in a relativistic plasma 
would be square root three times smaller than the speed of light. We also know very well at that time, the universe is um, largely radiation dominated. And so we know the distance the light, uh, the sound wave could have traveled in that time. So we know that the CMP fluctuations are created as a supervision of the spikes with rings around them. So I can imagine the fluctuations that I see in the micro background being decomposed into a spot and a ring. And I superimpose so many rings and I will get my microwave background sky. And the main important thing is this imprints a scale, a measurable physical scale on the IMAX screen. And that scale is very well known and it is 150 megaparsec. Okay, so I know this, some, some ruler I know on the screen and that is very, very important. Okay, now what can I do with this information? Okay, that information immediately allows you to deduce the curvature of the spatial hypersurface because I know one leg of this triangle. So I'm looking at this screen, I know it's 43 billion light years away. So all these yellow lines are 43 billion light years. I know that this is 150 megaparsec. Now, if this was a Euclidean triangle, the three angles must add up to 180 degree. Okay, so I should see the peak of the fluctuations. The and this, uh, you know, the ring that you have creates this series of peaks, harmonic peaks in the angular power spectrum. And the first peak, for example, gives you the size of the ripple, right? And then I know that the size of the ripple is. 150 megaparsec. I know the distance to the ripple. So it's a simple problem in geometry to ask, is the angular scale corresponding to L of 220, multiple of 220? If it was so, then the universe is spatially flat. If this multiple was uh, of the peak was larger than this, then the universe will be a hyperbolic surface. It's an underdense universe and it's uh, a negatively curved hypersurface. And if it was at a uh, multiple less than 220, we would have deduced a universe which is curved like a ball in the sense it has a positive curvature, the, like the surface of a ball. Okay, so this is one thing you can measure. The other thing you should realize that you can measure very well is the amount of ordinary matter because the ripple uh, is only the amount of radiation that will travel in the ripple would be proportional to the number of baryons that are there in the universe. Because there are uh, one fact of life that we know is uh, the number of photons in the microwave background is about a billion times larger than the number of baryons. So there are enough photons. So now the ripple will be as strong as the amount of baryons present in the universe because that will be the then strength of the ripple. So which means this height of the peak is sensitively measuring what is the baryon density, the ordinary matter density in the universe. And we knew that if it was consistent with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, where we can explain the emergence of hydrogen, helium, and some of the light nuclei by using nuclear processes in, the, in a very hot universe at about a billion Kelvin, then the baryon density would be 4% of the you know, uh, total density of the universe. Okay, critical density of the universe. And that is, would correspond to a CMB temperature fluctuation of 74 micro Kelvin. At this point, I don't know whether it's been already pointed out to you. The reason we are very confident that there is cold dark matter is because this is 74 Kelvin micro Kelvin and not 740 micro Kelvin. And we knew this fact even before 1990. Okay, that's because CMB measurements, which were trying to look for these fluctuations had already ruled out this fluctuation being 10 times larger than this. Okay, so instead of 4%, if I wanted to make it 20 times larger and say 100% of the universe, matter in the universe was baryonic, that was already ruled out by the search for fluctuations in the microwave background temperature way back in 1990, before 1990. 
So, of course, the first generation, as I said, first breakthrough was by Kobe, but uh, improvement was made by WMAP. And WMAP gave you a map of the fluctuation, something like this, okay? So these are maps we created with the publicly released data and we analyzed them. And this is the angular power spectrum you could get. So this is uh, from the first year did release, the third year release. Already at that time, if you look at this spectrum of the angular power spectrum, I can already see the first peak very clearly. And if I fit for the peak, I would, I would find that the peak is exactly at 220, multiple of 220 here, which means that the curvature of the universe is zero, the universe is spatially flat, and the amplitude of the fluctuations would be 74 micro, was 74.7 microkelvin, which was very close to the value that was predicted by nucleosynthesis. So about only 4% of the density, uh, critical density of the universe is made up of baryons. Okay. Now, that means the cosmic microwave background totally ruled out curvature density in the current universe, right? The curvature density, so we said, I told you that there were three players, the matter density, the vacuum energy, or the cosmological constant density, and the curvature density. And CMB actually ruled out the curvature density and told you that the universe is a stack of flat sheets, not a stack of uh, hyperbolic sheets or a stack of spheres, you know, in time, right? So it told you that now there are only two things that you have to worry about, how much of clustering matter is there and how much of dark energy is there. And this is a simple, uh, uh, simple um, algebraic uh, problem. Now I can, if I measure any, I'm sorry uh, for the interruption. Uh, this, um, this is some um, thing that had arrived for me. Um, so essentially micro background, the fact that the first peak is at multiple of 220 uh, tells you that there are only two things now to figure out how much is actually one thing, because if these two add up to one, I need to know one and I'll know the other automatically. And then, the other part of the puzzle actually is solved in two manners, but the first way is to look at this process I told you, trying to map the mildly perturbed universe that we see in the microwave to the present universe. Okay, and then the total energy density and all uh, is determined from there, which means I can also get you the dark matter density. And if I were to look at two snapshots where the fluctuations start from what we see in the microwave background, and I have a universe which has no cosmological constant, and uh, here below, and one with cosmological constant, you can see at the right end, the current structures look more like the upper one than the lower one. The size of the voids are much more consistent with what you see in the upper panel than the lower panel. Of course, this is not how we do the measurements, but uh, this tells you already that the matter density has to be 0.3 and there has to be a cosmological constant, which is about 0.7. Okay, that's from the last case structure. As I said, this is discernible by eye, but we don't do just by eye kind of measurement. So suppose I took that snapshot, actually compute what is the power spectrum. I ask how many galaxies are there in a typical volume of a particular size. So what we do is essentially throw spheres of this size randomly in the uh, galaxy survey and count up the amount of number of galaxies in each of the spheres. Now there will be an average which will give you the average density of the universe, but each sphere, you can see this sphere has very few galaxies, whereas this one has many, many galaxies. This is again less. So I can ask how much are the fluctuations of the amount of number of galaxies on spheres of this size blue. That I measure. So that is the fluctuation at the scale of the blue spheres. I can throw bigger spheres, do the same. I can throw smaller spheres and do the same. 
And I create what is called a power spectrum, just like the power spectrum of the micro background, I have a power spectrum of matter distribution. And I can make these measurements from large scale structure surveys. And you see measurements way back in 2004 already indicated that the curve actually is supposed to look like this red curve here for a cold dark matter model. And this where it turns around depends on how much of the cold dark matter uh, is there. And this told you that the dark matter in the universe was dark matter as plus baryons, which are a small fraction, one eighth of the dark matter, uh, added up to about 30% or 0.3 of the critical density. So we know two things now. Okay, we three things. In fact, we know the radiation energy density at this point is about a factor of 10,000 smaller than the critical density. We know that the baryonic density is about 4% of the critical density. And now we know the baryonic density plus the cold dark matter is about 30% of the critical density. Okay, but we know that the critical density, the universe is at critical density. So the rest of the 70% must be made up of something that doesn't cluster and the cosmological constant or vacuum energy is a very nice um, model for that. Okay, and this story is also, now there were two parts to the story which I brought together and said, I know the universe, but even with microwave background alone, in the era of Planck, which is like, uh, you know, a thousand times more sensitive than Kobe and a hundred times better resolution, which is the most refined measurements we have here. With this kind of uh, maps, quality maps, you get a power spectrum all the way from multiple two to multiple 2,500. And you see that it actually picks up one of the CL curves very well. You may not realize immediately, but all these dots here on the line have error bars. So you have to actually subtract the red line out of the dots to see the size of the error bars. Okay, they're very tiny. So that means we know the location of the first peak, second peak to uh, exquisite accuracy. See, it's 220 plus minus 0.5, right? And the amplitude here is squared, so you don't know, but it's consistent with being 74. And all the peaks, up to eight peaks, can be measured extremely well. So we know the cosmology extremely well. Okay, so the game is very clear. I have these green measurements, which are very accurate. They are from Planck. I have a predicted CL in a cosmological model, which is given by this gray line here. Okay, and that is given by a particular choice of values for the cosmological parameter. This is cold dark matter, baryonic density, and things like that. Okay, so what I will do is I will actually run what is called a Monte Carlo chain and keep varying the parameters and try to find the set of parameters for which the gray line comes and sits on the green dots, green measurements. I do that and this is actually, a, you know, kind of a video made out of Monte Carlo chain. And you can see that slowly you find actually that there's a curve that fits all the data extremely well. And you can read off the values of the cold dark matter, the baryonic dark matter, the Hubble constant and things like that right away, okay? And remember that the CMB physics is very well understood and accurately computed. So whatever we infer, we are very, very confident about our inference, okay? Within, of course, the standard paradigm of the universe being homogeneous and isotropic. Okay, so this is something pictures that you must have seen of the kind of constraint diagrams that you see uh, nowadays in the six parameter cosmology. Okay, so we know very confidently that the track on which our universe is, is this red curve. It's expanding at a faster and faster rate and it will have an accelerated expansion in the future. So we actually started with a very simple assumption and uh, that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, but we came up with very exotic uh, results even within that simple model. 
we know that the 95% of the energy density of the universe is in some exotic form. You know, um, in fact, some of it is dark matter which clusters under gravity, we, but we cannot see it in electromagnetic waves. And you have heard about dark matter searches and various ways of looking for it, but we can probe it through gravitational, its gravitational effect. And then that is of course, um, uh, something that I will mention a bit in the next talk. And then we know that most of the energy density is dark energy or the cosmological constant, some smooth form of energy which does not cluster under gravity, it acts repulsively under gravity. And another third important point, which I won't talk too much about in the next talk, is that I inferred all this in, by the perturbed universe. Now, I didn't answer the question or uh, we are yet to completely nail the question, uh, what was the origin of this primordial perturbation in the first place, right? And that already tells you that there is some ultra high energy uh, physics that is yet to be discovered by us. So there is physics at extremely high energy scales, which we don't know because we cannot explain the perturbation in the universe within the standard model of particle physics that we know. Okay, so thank you here. I will close my first talk at this point and take some questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Souradip. So <clears throat> uh, now it's uh, the question and answer uh, session. Uh, if someone wants to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand or write your question in the chat. Okay, uh, there is a question from Nisha Maharjan. Uh, oh, sorry, from Chandra Mouli Santra. So okay. please, uh, Chandra Mouli Santra, uh, you can... Uh, you can say... uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay, please. Yes, uh, nice talk, uh, Professor Shorudi. Uh, it was re really exciting. Uh, I just want to know one thing. Uh, is it possible that for further redshift in the future, the cosmic background, sorry, the, the cosmic mac microwave background will change into cosmic radio wave background? Yeah, very, very far in the future, yes. So now at this point, the peak of the microwave background is at about um, you know 100 gigahertz so you'll have to wait for the universe to expand by a factor of 100 or more okay in the future and then the peak will move to less than a gigahertz so you know radio antenna like the gmrt work at 1.4 gigahertz so okay. maybe at least wait for a factor of uh, 10 to 20 before it gets to the radio band what is called okay, okay. and that's it's uh, in the millimeter wave. And sir, uh, I uh, re I read it somewhere else that in the beginning, uh, after just after the dark age, uh, the universe is in orange in color. Is it true? And that thing expands to infrared and then microwave region, which we know now CMB. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, dark. I mean, I didn't quite get what you wanted to say. The universe, yes, if I were to look back in time on the surface of the universe, if I had that ability, then as I go uh, back in time, I would see a dark period beyond the first galaxies forming. So it's first start formed when the universe had about a factor of seven smaller or factor of 10 smaller. Beyond that, there was no structure in the universe, so there was no light. It was mm -hmm. a transparent universe. You only saw the microwave at that time at redshift of 10, it will be at 30 Kelvin. Oh. Okay. And then you go further back in time, you will start seeing the glow of the plasma surface. Yes, when that's get what to, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. So there is a period of dark ages from redshift of 1100. Uh, if I were in a spacecraft uh, time machine back then, the universe will be totally devoid of any light because there won't be any light sources and the microwave background photons will be going around you. So you will see that glow, but it will be at what 30 micro Kelvin glow. 
So it will, it won't be dark, but it will be dark optically. And then the light again starts getting emitted from stars when they're formed. Okay. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, sir. So uh, the next question is from Nishal Maharjan. Uh, please you say your question. Hello. Hello, yes, uh, please. Uh, my question is, uh, what does different peaks in CMB power spectrum signify? I, I told you the significance of the first peak. Uh, similarly, the significance uh, has, uh, uh, the significance in the ratio of the height of the first to the, uh, you know, second peak and second to the third peak. The ratio of the heights actually is a much more refined measurement of the omega baryon, for example. Okay. Then there are small differences in the location of the other peaks given by the amount of cold dark matter. And that's why we can infer all these quantities so well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Soradip, uh, could you uh, stop the uh, share screen so that people can see your face? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is from uh, Mohammed Rafif Rabani. Please ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Soradip, for the magnificent lecture. I have two questions. The first one is related. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the first one is related to the measurements of the CMB. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, how can we be sure that the measured radiations from the satellites come from CMB itself and not from foreground objects, for example, galaxies, etc.? Yes, that's a very good question. We need to, that's why, although I said you measure it, we don't measure it at one wavelength. We measure it at many, many wavelengths. And the point is the microwave background fluctuations will be consistent to with the black body spectrum fluctuations. And the fluctuation in black body uh, temperature is known to have no frequency dependence if we are talking about the temperature. Okay. So it, uh, the temperature fluctuations for the original CMB fluctuation will be the same at 100 gigahertz or 200 gigahertz or 300 gigahertz, okay? And also 50 gigahertz. But uh, any other thing like a galaxy shines at different intensity at different frequencies because the processes there are frequency dependent. And we can use that multi-wavelength, uh, multi-frequency measurements. So every satellite, so Kobe had three bands WMAT had uh, about five bands and uh, Planck had nine bands. And these are, you know, ways to make, uh, remove what you are talking about, the foreground emission, to make sure that what we are seeing is the primordial fluctuations of the micro background and not uh, something else. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Reddy. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, is sorry, I have uh, the second question. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, my second question is, as we know, there is currently a problem in cosmology, uh, usually named the Hubble tension. And uh, one of the approach to solve this is to introduce new physics. And since, uh, as you explained, we already know the physics of the CMB very well, uh, do you think there is still a room for such new physics to be introduced? I mean, it depends on whom we talk to. Of course, uh, the CMB community is very confident about its results. And we think that there is no new physics required to explain the observations. Of course, you can play around with the model and still recover the CMB thing and try to fit the Hubble constant uh, thing, but that requires some new ingredient, typically in the neutrino sector or some early dark energy or many models. But there hasn't been a very successful model which can explain the CMB fluctuations uh, from measured by Planck and also measure simultaneously the, uh, and also infer a Hubble constant uh, consistent with the local measurements. So the tension is between measurements of the Hubble parameter or the value of the expansion rate uh, inferred from CMB measurements, which is about 67.2, but with very tiny error bars. Remember I told you it's about a, a couple of percent error bar, 1.3% error bar. 
at one and a half percent. Whereas the other one has much larger error bar, but it is centered around uh, 74, uh, Hubble constant of 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. These are from uh, supernova, high redshift supernova measurements uh, led by Adam Rees and collaborators is called SHOES, the collaboration is called SHOES. Our point is either those measurements are not accurate or the error bars have been underestimated. Okay, that is one point of view. If this tension still continues, of course, it might mean that there's new physics. Uh, but uh, at least if you're asking for a personal view, I wouldn't bet on new physics yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Thomas Nabil Taufik. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Uh, my question is toward the end. Um, you mentioned that we don't know the reason yet behind density perturbations, uh, but I read if the um, that quantum fluctuations could could describe uh, the the perturbations. Is this is correct or not? Yes, yeah, so that's our best understanding we have, but we don't have full verification of that. And one of the things we are waiting for is to measure primordial gravitational wave signatures of primordial gravitational waves from this process of inflation. Okay, and that would really convince everyone that uh, indeed. Uh, we understand the origin of the perturbations. And that is the next quest. And as I said, I will just allude to that quest, uh, but uh, that will be covered in the lecture by uh, Professor Komatsu. Uh, okay, but, but I, I think that we, we were able to produce the, the, the power spectrum of the CMB using the idea of fluctuations, right? Yes, yes. So the initial fluctuations, the question is whether it is Inflation or something different from inflation is the big question. But some, some high energy physics uh, model, but even if we know that there is an inflationary uh, epoch, we, would, we can only infer the energy scale and very few things about it. But at this point, there's no particle physics model or few, you know, high energy physics model that gives you, or it's a natural choice for the inflationary model as it. Okay, mm -hmm. which is what makes people worried and they would like to see that nailed uh, by the measurement of the primordial gravitation waves from inflation. Okay, thank you, Professor. Hello, uh, uh, the next question is from Bosra Mezi Geche. Uh, please ask your question. Okay, you cannot use your microphone. So uh, the question is why you don't take the radiation density into consideration in your calculation? Uh, we don't take the radiation density into uh, consideration in our calculations of the universe now, because the radiation density is one part in 10,000 of the matter density, okay? Uh, so it's unimportant. I'm not saying we don't take into account. We can take into account and we do because uh, when the universe was 10,000 times smaller, radiation density was the same as matter density now. But at this point, the radiation density is not dominating the dynamics of the cosmological expansion. That's what I meant by it's unimportant, but we know its value very well because it is uh, given by Stefan Boltzmann law. Uh, it's the fourth power of uh, three Kelvin bath uh, multiplied by the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Right, so we know the energy density of the microwave background or the re relic radiation extremely well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So is there other uh, question? We still have time. Okay, so there is a, a question from Ayush Gotam. Uh, please you ask your question. So am I audible? Yes, yes, okay. So thank you, Mr. Sar, for the lecture. So my question is, uh, what is the reason for uh, greater uncertainties or uh, error parts for lower multiples in the, um, let's say, the power spectrum of CMB? Mm. Thank you. That's an interesting, uh, very smart question because uh, you wouldn't expect it. Actually, we, our instrumental noise for those low multiples is very small. 
But the reason the error bars are big is something because of cosmic variance. You see, when, I, when you make measurements in your lab, you make multiple measurements to independent measurements. And you know that if you average multiple independent measurements, the error bar shrinks by square root n. Now you imagine you measure the multipole of the CMB, CL, uh, uh, angular power spectrum at a L of 10. How many independent measurements can I make? I can make only 21, two L plus one independent measurements. For L of 100, I can make 201 measurements. Okay, but at L of two, I can only make five measurements. So you see the error part is intrinsically large for this uncertainty. It's not really an instrumentation related problem. So this is called the cosmic variance. This is an inherent inability to infer the value of the power spectrum to a greater extent because there is this, what is a, what we would also call sample variance. I have only five modes for the quadrupole or the L equal to two, only seven modes for the L equal to three. Okay, whereas when I go to higher multiples, that uncertainty is small. So that higher multiples, then this up to Planck is uh, cosmic variance limited up to a multiple of 1500, which means we cannot expect any experiment to improve the angular power spectrum any further for most of the measurement area, right? Up to a multiple of 2000, there's very little room for improvement in the error bus with future high sensitivity, much more sensitive measurements. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. So is there any other questions? <clears throat> or maybe I can ask uh, uh, other question. Uh, if we, we see the uh, measurements of the uh, CMB from many direction, we can see different color. Yeah, there's a uh, red color, uh, yellow and also blue. So uh, besides uh, showing the difference in temperature, uh, can we interpret it, it as a uh, different distance from us? It's equivalent in some sense, because in an expanding universe, when the temperature in a particular region, and that's only true for the large scale fluctuations, scale on angular scales bigger than two degrees, the fluctuations can be also interpreted as the last scattering surface being not exactly the same distance away everywhere. So photons which are slightly closer to us redshift by a slightly lesser amount than the ones which are coming from a surface which is slightly further from us. So that's one way of, because this is related to the gauge freedom in uh, general relativity. And you can interpret temperature fluctuations also as uh, different distances to the last scattering surface. But this is only for the fluctuations which are larger than two degrees. Okay, thank you. So is there any other questions? No other questions? How if we uh, take a picture uh, together? So okay. maybe the host can uh, make a picture and then if we still have time, we can continue the uh, question and answer session. Okay, everyone, now we are taking a picture with Professor Saradip. So I invite you to open your camera. Wait a moment. Please switch on your camera. Okay. Your video. Okay. Uh, the first page. Okay. And then Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I return to Kunjaya. Okay, okay, thank you. So we we have uh, our picture together for, for this session. So we still have time. If you still have a uh, question, please ask uh, your questions.
So no other questions. So if there is no other questions, uh, you know, we will I will uh, return the session uh, to the host, and we will um, meet again uh, in the next session also with uh, Professor Suradip uh, at three thirty. Uh, 3 30 p.m. Indonesian time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your uh, attendance. And thank you very much for Professor Prun Suradip uh, for your very excellent uh, uh, lecture. It will be uh, give enlightenment to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.